Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. This episode is part of my conversation with Chief Peter Davis. Chief Peter Davis of Galveston Beach Patrol is the president of the United States Lifeguarding Association. In this episode, a quick history of the founding and evolution of Galveston Beach Patrol. Did you know that Galveston Beach Patrol helps found and assist other beach patrol organizations across the globe? Check out the episode description for a link to our full conversation. We discuss a famous Galveston lifeguard who is listed in the Guinness Book of World Records, more Galveston Beach Patrol history, and of course, beach safety. Without further ado, let's hop into this excerpt from my conversation with Chief Peter Davis, President of the United States Lifeguarding Association and Chief of Galveston Island Beach Patrol. My mom, you know, growing up, she was a beach girl too, and she always told me stories about... Um, you know, that they would go down with her aunts, these, these German ladies, and um, they would, uh, you know, bring fine china down there and set up tablecloths and, you know, have this like really nice meal of chicken and whatever oh down there. Gosh. And then she would go sit on uh, Leroy Colombo's lap because my mom would be about five years old. Yep. They'd go over there by Murdoch's and Leroy Colombo would be guarding. And then, you know, he he liked this little brown beach yeah. kid, you know, and he'd always like, come up here, you know, whatever. So apparently she sat up there all the time and then, uh, you know, it helped him supposedly help him lifeguard, which is really cool to know that like your family, you know, has this like lineage of beach history because we don't associate that with Texas. A lot of times we think of, you know, this legacy that's passed down through generations in Hawaii of, of you know, water skills, and beach skills and that kind of stuff, California, of course, and a bit on the East coast, but we don't think of Texas as having this long history, but we really do like, um, we can trace our life-saving roots continuously back to 1875 uh, when there was a, a life station down there at San Luis Pass area. Then there there were some gaps before that. But even in the 1840s, there was some kind of lifeguard service here. And in those years, there wasn't recreational swimming to speak of. And so they were literally looking for boat wrecks. Um, and they would have like, you know, a group of people, you know, living in a community down there and they're, and all the basically all the men that's how it worked back then right but all the men would be the lifesaver men there'd be a station master then their families and 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 you know everything would be around there as sort of like a support system for that and that dates really far back and then as we kind of moved into industrial revolution um leisure class uh recreational swimming started popping up and so galveston was you know on the map big time back then and so galveston was a really important spot um for kind of the middle, upper middle class, rich people to come and, you know, uh, enjoy the the healing. What does they call it? The healing powers of the salt water. You know, you read these old like posters yes. and stuff. It's really interesting. So they had like bathing machines where they would push the machines out into the water. And then, you know, the, the swimmer would step down into the water, big outfit or something and get back in. And then they'd probably go to Crystal Palace and party. And of course, you know, yeah, get into so. all kinds of other things. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> So we, we actually, we have, and you know, beach guarding started, you know, very early in, in the, the turn of the century then. And so we had uh, volunteer lifeguard service until about the thirties, paid lifeguards. Um, it kind of bounced around. It sat at about 17 to 25 people. It would just kind of come and go with politics and with whatever funding. And that went on for years and years and years, even into uh, up into the eighties. And so in eighty. One, um, we, we were passed from the management of the police department under the sheriff's office. There was a Moody grant that really funded a whole bunch of our infrastructure. Um, and we started using hot tax money that was funneled through the Park Board of Trustees. The Park Board had been established in like 61 or 63 or something like that. I think it was 63. Um, and so the, the vehicle was already there. Um, to do that. And our, our money started coming through there. Um, although like when I started, we were a division of the sheriff's office and the money flowed, you know, through the city park board. And then, um, not even that long ago, um, it's been about 15, 16 years ago. Um, we ended up uh, a little bit before you, you know, mm -hmm. were there but I, we, when I was in junior guards, we were still wearing sheriff's green. You were still wearing green and white. Yep. Right. Yeah. White, yeah. You yep. yeah. see, that shows how old you are. You're yeah. I'm, I'm getting age. old. I know <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> so we, yeah. So when we went to, um, Move from being just under the county with the city funding, park board funding. We moved just under the management of the park board those years ago. So we still, you know, have a whole lot of debt, I think, to the sheriff's office because we have a lot of our infrastructure, our policies, all this kind of stuff. We're very sophisticated for a 
uh, Beach Lifeguard Agency at the time because we were had that affiliation with the law enforcement entity. Um, and then the Park Board has really, you know, the last few years particularly, has really stepped up their game a lot too. And so now we're actually, we have a whole lot of give and take with other departments, a lot of sharing. Um, and it's been really wonderful for me because, you know, for the longest time, um, we were just making do with what we had. And, and now we just really have this support system we never really had before. Yeah. So great HR department. We have, you know, great relationship with the beach, uh, coastal zone management people, the parks are there for us, the CVB, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so um, it's really nice. To, I really like this sort of team thing. Like, I, I think that we're a lot stronger in groups. So making all these connections with different groups within the park board or other partners in public safety through the Galveston Marine Response um, and then even other groups like the, um, the, the Marine Mammal Stranding Network or the tur- turtle people or the, you know, um, our, our own junior guard program, survivor support network program, uh, wave watchers. We have all these kind of affiliations yes. that I think create a, basically a water safety net that reduces drowning because, you know, seven and a half million people a year is way too much for one lifeguard service to handle. So we really need to kind of create a culture of, of water safety to help keep people from drowning. And and you know that from when you were a guard. Like, I do. Yeah. And yeah. and I wanted to say, you know, speaking of building a culture of water safety, just the junior guard program is starting young. I think the youngest you can hop in is 10 or 11. No, right? 10. Yeah, 10, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. speaking personally, me going through that junior guard program just taught me so much about water safety. And I remember I uh, used to live on 57th and Mako, right oh, behind yeah. where Kroger is, right? So I remember going out and I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And there was a guy in waders, fishing waders, and he fell over and his, his waders filled up with water. And I, I remember being 13 in junior guards going out there and pull, like helping this guy up, stand oh up. God, that's yeah, so cool. yeah. And uh, no, that, that, that has been, you know, th- that's has been a really cool thing with junior guards because every year or two we get these stories. We just had a, a couple of our um, junior guards do CPR on a person, wow. and, you know, just this, this kind of, or, or I've heard a, a couple of years ago, there was a rescue in Costa Rica by one of our junior guards and, and while they were out surfing. Like this kind of thing is really neat. It's this whole concept, which is not foreign to us now because of COVID, but you know, this whole concept of herd immunity, where if everyone's inoculated, except for a couple of people in a bigger group, they're probably not going to catch whatever the thing is. And, and drowning works very, in a very similar way. Like the junior guard program, or the 30,000 or so kids we hit at these water safety talks when we do our spring education program out in the schools. You know, the idea is that, like, if these kids all sort of have the basics of how – I would keep it simple, but how not to drown mm-hmm. when they go out in the water. The little things you know, like stay away from rock jetties or or don't go too far out or, you know, whatever the, the little rules are that we push out there. Um, you know, if they all know that, then their friends won't exceed those rules because they're going to be with the group that yep. knows it. So the more kids we can train, the more people are prepared to be safe when they come to the beach. And it takes the burden, you know, not just off of us, but off of all of our society or the, you know, or Galveston or whatever. It reduces liability, you know, it enhances tourism, like it, everybody, you know, benefits from this. So the the really important thing I think of of our mission is, you know, we do the things that lifeguards are supposed to do rescue, train, yep. you know, prevent accidents directly, that kind of stuff. But we also have this huge component of public education. Um, even, you know, getting to talk a little bit about water safety with you is really valuable just to get it out to as many places as we can. So when people come here, you don't count on the lifeguard being your only line of defense. You want several things to have to fail before you get in trouble. I, I think I'll I want to go back and touch on the the initiation of a beach patrol organization. I was reading a little bit about the San Luis Pass station and also that there was a station set up at Coons Wharf. Mm-hmm. So you I know you mentioned that they would that was have earlier, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. It really all initiated from uh rescuing people on ships, whether they were, you know, ships that were on fire, burning, sinking, yeah. but that's how it initiated and then moved more into a beach service. Beach patrol or the beach patrol organization was federally funded, actually. They received two, over like $200,000 from the federal government. So I guess that shows how important Galveston was. Yeah, being being such a busy port, um, and that was before uh, you know Houston really got as big as it was with the port and everything like that. Boats didn't have as deep a draft back yep. then, so they could get into Galveston really easily. Um, and so, you, you know, you ended up with the U.S. Life Saving Service, and the, there was federal funding that came to all these places all around the country um, through that. Because at the time, ships were our main means of yep. moving goods and services around and people too. Like mm-hmm. there wasn't this whole infrastructure with now to get around. And so they wanted to protect that as best they could. And so that was worth the money 
But even if you look at the history through that stuff, like you mentioned this, there's a fire and, you know, there was people and I think animals on a boat that the whole, everybody was standing around on the wharf, watching it burn, watching people die, you know, that kind of stuff happened. If you read the history, and it's not just ours, but if you look at, you know, all around the country or really all around the world, we kind of go in these surges. So we are not always the most proactive about any kind of public safety. And even back then it was true. So we, you would see that they would establish this great service for the time. Um, and they'd have this equipment that would be contemporary and they'd have people trained and stuff like that. And then it, nothing would happen. And then it would kind of fizzle away. And like you read these accounts, like the boats were stored somewhere else. They don't know where they were. They, you know, the, and, and then something huge would happen. And then all of a sudden there'd be renewed interest. And then, you know, they would lobby for more money or they would, you know, drum up people or whatever. And so you'd see this, 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 this wharf place. So suddenly it was renewed and then it was really good and it ran for 20, 25 years mm-hmm. and then it would start fading again. We do the same thing now. If you look historically at any, any public safety group, you know, it, sometimes it takes a crisis for everybody to realize, oh, wait, this is really important. I think we've gotten better about it. And I think we've gotten better as um, representatives of the public safety groups where we're talking police, fire, EMS, lifesaving of advocating um, what our, you know, for what our needs are. The Galveston Beach Patrol also assists other beach patrols in other countries either get started or assist their programs kind of get rolling. Is that, is that how that works? Or? It is. And it, that's an interesting kind of way that that develop. Um, and it, this is kind of right place, right time stuff. But for whatever reason, I, you know, I'm ba- pretty bilingual. Like I speak Spanish pretty decent. And we went with a sister city committee down to Veracruz, uh, which was, you know, Years back, this me and Vic Maceo went with a, a delegation from Galveston, um, and we connected to um, some of their lifeguards. They had just started a lifeguard program, yeah. like brand new, and they didn't know what they were doing at all. Like we, you know, so they had you know maybe kids of fisher, you know, fishermen kids or um, you know whatever they had. Then they had these two really just amazing jet skis, like shiny, and yeah. but then none of them could swim very well, and you know that oh, kind of stuff. No. And so. We, we were there and, and I, I was like, well, how did you learn? Cause they don't have other lifeguard services up and down the coast. And they didn't have like, we had the benefit of, you know, all this connection to California and the East coast. We, we learned so much from these other groups when we were starting to professionalize. And they were like, well, we, two ways. We know a lot about the water because of the fishing, because they, that's a fishing community yep. and they, they really do know. I mean, the, the boat skills of these guys is just off the charts. Mm-hmm. And then the other one they, they used, they had a great source was from America of information from a TV show called Guadianas de la Bahia, uh, which I was like, what is it? Oh, Baywatch. Baywatch. Yeah. So yeah, they learned a lot from Baywatch. Baywatch. Yeah. Baywatch. So, yeah. So needless to say, they were, they were all about the uh, form, but not the content, if that makes sense. But <laughs> so we ended up um, offering, you know, to have them come up uh, and we sent a team down um, and that started a relationship and we been doing it for about 20 years and so we're looking at even next november we're talking talk about sending a team down but because i'd done that work um and you know was reasonably proficient in spanish i got asked uh i, I was doing this side kind of side hustle thing where i taught uh, some red cross stuff to a school down in venezuela okay. and so i went down there i had some connection through my brother or whatever and, and they just contracted with me to teach yeah. you know like a, a, a lifeguarding class and when I was there, the president of the United States Life Saving Association at the time um, was like, hey, I've been corresponding with this this person with their national YMCA, and they want to start a beach program. Could you bring them our manual down there? You know, that was pre, uh, you know, good internet, you know, like that kind of stuff. So I was like, sure. So I went down there. I went to the YMCA, which is on the other side of Caracas, which is a whole different world from the, the private school I was teaching there, yeah. right? And I, and I really, you know, I was there and they were like, hey, can you come tomorrow and can you do this? And, he, and so I was like, so I ended up during the time I was there teaching the, the school stuff in the morning and the afternoon I'd go over to the YMCA and, and work with, with them. And yeah. they, they had just an amazing program. They had kids that were street kids that they brought up and they lived in this big structure and they became their instructors and all this stuff. And so I ended up spending time with them and starting to work with them a bit. And I ended up making 12, 14 trips down to Venezuela um, and doing that. And while that was going on, I started getting more involved in our national association. So, you know, now I'm the sitting, it's like third term of agony, but I'm the, I'm the president of our national lifeguard association in the U S now, right. Which is all that mostly the beach organizations. And I do work for this international group called the international life saving federation, which that connected me to, which is um, uh, in the Americas region, the Caribbean and Latin America, that kind of stuff. So I'm kind of like the coordinator of aid, like a secretary general is the title. Right? <laughs> I like that. Secretary yeah, general. Yeah, it feels very European, doesn't it? Right? <laughs> and then, um, so, so I've been doing, a, you know, a bunch of work through them, 
uh, all around. And then the cool thing about it is, is for the Galveston Beach Patrol, we be through this conduit. We know about life saving, you know, techniques from anywhere, Europe, uh, all through Asia, South America, you know, all, and so you can kind of pick the things that work for our environment. Yep. Uh, and we've learned so much through that. Uh, and the other thing is we get to showcase our life road service, which is just exceptional, you know, and, and so we can actually uh, export some of what we're doing. So like our, our um, procedure manual, for example, we get asked all the time if people can have a look at that and adapt it to their stuff. We help set up the lifeguard services, two of them down in South Padre Island. We help with the Port Aransas one. Uh, we're working on Corpus. It'll be, we're still working on Corpus, but trying to get Texas all on the same page with that, too. Um, but also, you know, being able to really do stuff, you know, all over the place. Like I went to Norway a couple of years ago. Um, They're starting a beach program there and they wanted to have um, – they really liked what we were doing here in Galveston and they like some of the U S stuff. And so they wanted to have like a, a resource for that too. And uh, I, I could list a bunch of places, yeah. but, but it, it's been, you know, a real fun ride. I never thought life saving would, you know, expose you to that kind of stuff, but it's just been such a great benefit for us here in Galveston because if there's anything we need, like we have all these connections. Yeah, you've got this international yeah. network mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and really you can pull, like you said, you can pull from anywhere in the world. If there's a new technique or there's something going on over in Asia, yeah. you can bring it here and vice versa. Then they learn from what it's true. you guys are doing in Galveston. Yeah, and it's 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 really like, um, I think it's just in the spirit of what public safety is about mm -hmm. and really what Galveston has been about. I mean, we're, we're, we're a community that has been never afraid to like adapt and hork stuff from other places and, you know, and, and modify it to our own purposes and stuff like that. And, and I think that, you know, our life good service is a reflection of what, who we are as a people here in Galveston. And I couldn't so agree more. Yeah. Could not agree yeah. more. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Galveston Unscripted. If you would like to learn more about Chief Peter Davis or listen to the full Galveston Unscripted conversation, check out the link in the description below. And please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen. It helps us out immensely. Thanks for listening in, and we'll see you next time on Galveston Unscripted. For historic resources or more information, check out the episode description.